you here with you guys. Um, it definitely was a wealth of knowledge uh, seeing the presentations earlier. Um, I feel like I uh, can testify to what Mr. Shryer just said, being a, a pracademic, uh, practical <laughs> academic. So I, I, I can definitely associate with that. So this afternoon, I have the huge honor of talking to you guys about big data and financial technology. And uh, I, I just actually noticed the, the devices that are coming up here are getting smaller and smaller. So uh, we went from a PC to a tablet, and I'm going to use my smartphone just to see how best I can uh, do this thing, right? So what is FinTech, and how does it work? The intersection of big data and FinTech, and the challenges in big data and FinTech. And what does the future hold for both of these things? So in 1993, financial technology was actually first coined as a term. Uh, it coincided with the consortium that was established by Citico. So FinTech is the portmanteau of the terms finance and technology, hence FinTech. I know I'm preaching to the choir right now in the presence of so many people that are familiar with the concept, but indulge me. So FinTech is not a new industry. It's just one that has evolved very quickly due to the recent advancements in technology and data architecture. And I want you guys to think about you know, what cloud computing and cloud services have offered over the past couple of years. So in a sense, the advancements in technology revolutionize a lot of industries, such as manufacturing, entertainment, FMCG, and financial services. FinTech refers to the software the algorithms and applications for both computer and mobile-based tools, and in some cases, it also includes the hardware. It's a catch-all term for any technology that is used to augment, streamline, digitize, or disrupt traditional financial services. So FinTech platforms enable run-of-the-mill tasks like depositing checks, moving money am among accounts, paying bills, applying for financial aid, so it doesn't just go over the traditional or popular notion of cryptocurrencies and uh, you know just uh, mobile wallets. There's a ton of applications that use financial technology, and businesses re rely heavily uh, upon financial technology for payment processing, e-commerce transactions, accounting, and others, which have set itself apart as the more popular things that uh, have become synonymous with fintech. So in the wake of COVID-19, more and more businesses are turning to FinTech to enable features like contactless payments and other tech fuel transactions. Historically, FinTech was applied primarily by traditional financial institutions to optimize their back-end systems, which are the ones that we've been more familiar with uh, in recent times. Um, people adopting um, mobile applications to transfer money, uh, even things like PayPal and uh, I guess the ones that we're most popular with is shopping on Amazon. However, the current emphasis is in the consumer space and the creation of consumer-oriented services. More importantly, the creators of these fintech products are no longer only financial services, but sometimes at the core, technology companies that have established and not established banks and financial institutions. So, where does big data and fintech meet? FinTech refers to any business that uses, uh, that uses technology to enhance or automate financial services and processes, while big data refers to the collective term of ever-growing large, diverse, structured, and unstructured data sets. It also refers to the large amounts of volume gathered from social, mach machine, and transactional sources. Put simply, big data is a group of complex, unorganized data sets that grow exponentially in volume, variety, and velocity. So I'm sure that's a catchphrase that you guys have heard a lot uh, in this space, the volume, variety, and velocity of, of data. So contemporary enterprises and sectors around the world aren't strangers to the cliche term right now, which is that data is the new gold. 
Big data analytics is understood as a complex process of applying tools and techniques to analyze big data to uncover patterns, correlation, trends, and preferences that can help organizations make more informed decisions. Big data has become the ultimate game changer that has the power to turn fintech, the fintech sector upside down. I think right now fintech is and big data have become ubiquitous, they've become very synonymous. So this is really just a breakdown of how big data and financial technology intersect. You have your application at the core of it, which is what overlays what people interact with. Those things create tons and tons of data that feed into the repositories that have given life to cloud services and data storage services. From there, you can analyze that data, mine it. That has been come, become quickly the popular terminology, mining and wrangling of data. From that, we can create insight, and this feeds into consumer satisfaction and revenue generation. In a nutshell, this is what the ecosystem looks like, a very typical ecosystem in which you derive big data and financial technology. Big data in finance refers to the petabytes of structured and unstructured data that might be utilized by banks and financial organizations to predict co consumer behavior and develop strategies. In general, the financial sector creates large amounts of data. Think about how many times you use your debit and credit cards or transfer money via your mobile applications, make online purchases, and so on. And now compound that and you can see how quickly that evolves. The connectivity of financial services to the Internet of Things has drastically also contributed to the production of data. For example, structured data, and I used this terminology earlier, structured data is really what the applications themselves give life to. Yeah, so you make a transfer to someone else, that contributes directly to, to structured data. Unstructured data, on the other hand, is accumulated from a variety of different sources, such as images, social media, emails, and think about voice notes even, if you were to share information. All of these unstructured data sources, you can quickly see how they will change the landscape of and contribute to what we know as big data. So the growth of these areas have um, contributed to those things, and I wanted to give you guys a perspective of a day of data. And I do want to thank uh, Raconteur for providing this image. So a typical day of data generation, uh, on the far left hand side you can see people generate like about 500 million tweets per day. Uh, we even have uh, 3.9 billion email users contributing to about 4.306 uh, billion emails sent daily. Uh, on Facebook alone we have about 4 petabytes worth of data. And to put it in perspective, if a uh, petabyte doesn't make much sense, it's about 11,000 um, 4K movies. Yeah? And that's how much is generated times four on Facebook per day. And these come from photos, uh, videos. We have about 65 billion messages sent over what, WhatsApp daily. We have 95 million photos and videos shared on Instagram, right? We're expected by the year 2025 to have about 463 exabytes worth of data produced daily. To put it in perspective, just think back to a couple of years ago with the invention of the SD cards to support your smartphones. Those were about 128 megabytes. Yeah? And think about the production of what data is going to be in a couple of years. It's going to be in exabytes. Yeah? So I wanted to draw a, an analogy to a, a popular case study um, from our Reuters report. And again, not to be contentious about cryptocurrency, but it is a type of fintech. So I'm sure you guys might drill me a little bit on this after, but sure, we'll talk about it. Um, so as Venezuela's economy regresses, um, the adoption of cryptocurrency um, has emerged as, a, as an alternative to traditional banking systems. And it was pretty much used uh, to hedge against that depreciating currency. So in a case where the uh, existing fiat currency was so volatile, 
something uh, a little bit more stable presenting its, in itself in the form of cryptocurrency, which is actually quite interesting to say that something like cryptocurrency, which it itself is slightly volatile, um, was providing uh, a safer alternative for these customers, well, for these uh, the people in the country to use as a, as a source of, um, of payment. More interestingly, that report um, from Chain Analysis, Chain Analysis, uh, they suggested that the adoption, the adoption rate of uh, the Boulevard transactions on the uh, exchange actually ranked Venezuela third on the global crypto adoption index. That goes to show in 2020 how largely used this was as a, a, as a payment system or as a transaction system ra rather. So in Venezuela, crypto is mainly used to hedge against uh, inflation that cause, causes bank deposits to sharply depreciate in weeks or even days. And thus, you know, we had the more recent evolution of uh, crypto adoption within the region with El Salvador and um, with Argentina. So this man, he's kind of tired of doing like, you know, repetitive tasks, right? So I also wanted to give you guys an illustration that it's not only about, uh, you know, crypto, right? Which is where the popularity, I guess, for a lot of the fintech adoption has come from any generation of big data, right? So we have there on the left hand side, you know, people who are worried about their credit scores, um, you know, those people that you see, those older folks that you see uh, around the curbside at the banks waiting to deposit their pension checks. Um, you know, people who have to really save up to do that credit, that, that car loan or that uh, upscale into a newer home, right? But with, the fin with FinTech adoption, uh, people can use applications pretty much to check their credit scores real time. Um, you know, I know that there's work being done uh, on being able to take pictures within the region and do that deposit uh, to, to cash a check versus having to stand up in banks and, and, and deposit them physically. Uh, taking out a car loan online, those things have become almost uh, mainstream right now and probably some of the growth of it is due to COVID. So I mean, in a, in a way, COVID did uh, increase digital adoption to a certain degree. Um, and people now have even like robo-advisors where it uses artificial intelligence to help them make wiser financial choices and decisions. And all of these innovations uh, use and create big data, which can help us create better products and services, create personalized offers, monitor fraud and anomalies, uh, develop more digital assets, improve customer experience, reduce misinformation, and improve revenues for businesses. So I just wanted to give you guys uh, an example of what you know some of the in, in international companies have been doing, um, both coupling fintech and big data. So the US-based company SoFi.com uses a combination of payment processing with POS, uh, a lending mechanism that enable users to get loans right at checkout. They specifically target young professionals and help them to pay, save, invest, and borrow money in the most effective way and secure way. A Swedish company called Greater Than uses masses, massive amounts of literally on the ground information on road accidents that help their business apply its machine learning to aid in insurance companies offering uh, better pricing and estimating risks. Market leaders like Klarna and Affirm use big data and AI models for microfinancing and other types of lending. Airbnb and, and Zillow utilize big data and AI to maximize profit margins while op offering competitive real estate prices. And they factor in information such as credit scores, distance, number of dependents, and all of these things real time. Goldman Sachs uses machine learning algorithms and natural language pro processing components not just to perform quantitative analysis on investments, but also to assess media context and tonality of public disclosure re in relation to investors. So what are some of the use cases in big data? I mean, those were some very good examples that we've seen there, but there's so much more that big data can lead to in terms of adoption. Fraud prevention is one of them. That's what, probably one of the most popular ones right now in use cases. And we have in there intelligence applications for anti-money laundering, a single platform for end-to-end -end, uh, fraud detection and protection, blockchain technologies for increasing the safety of direct transactions, and machine learning for communicating and monitoring customer identification. 
Risk analysis, uh, through the adoption of big data, you can better manage risk, monitor risk, monitor audit management, and create risk models. There's also consumer behavior analysis, and this by far is probably one of the most widely used uh, use cases of big data, and I think it's the one that people are most familiar with it with in our region. Um, using data to pretty much analyze your customer bases and optimize on what can be the best cross-sell to serve customers, estimate and increase client value over time, reduce losses by decreasing the number of non-zero uh, value customers that you have, and dividing customers into segments. Um, enhancing the business's reputation as a trusted partner. Credit allocation has also become quite popular in recent times. Um, opening financial in information that is easily exchanged among financial services, such as banks, for example, and the information provided by other financial companies. These things present like what we know as customer 360s on their credit scores. There's also predictive analytics product improvement, algorithmic trading, personalized marketing, improvements to CX and UX, identif identification of new opportunities, staff productivity, improved decision making. Yes, you can see the large array of things that big data can use to be used to support in financial technology. So what are some of the challenges uh, to big data and FinTech? Well, the more common ones that occur within the region are regulatory pressures. Regardless of modernization of financial services, the industry is heavily regulated. We have various aspects of regulation that need to be accounted for, including FATCA, AML, CFT, um, GDPR, FRTB, and many others. Um, and more importantly, uh, these things, while the rules are very, very necessary, and rightfully so, they can't stifle further research and advancements in fintech. Lack of IT infrastructure. Well, it's no secret that uh, although uh, the cost uh, from traditional hardware has decreased because of cloud, it's still a very expensive venture. And so the lack of IT infrastructure, without the proper tools, techniques, and infrastructure, it's complicated to harness and analyze big data properly, let alone integrate artificial intelligence and machine learning models into existing systems. Insufficient capital to integrate everything big data encompasses um, businesses, uh, and they've quite frankly been working with uh, outdated legacy systems. Poor data quality. Uh, this is a, an age-old problem that businesses experience. Incorrect data collection methods, which can lead to poor adoption in fintech services and also lead to risks in its own ways. Um, and also to correct this, the, in the reinvestment of money uh, into this is also quite exorbitant. Yeah, that, that Other issues uh, include market readiness, the talent pool, the global economy's um, applicability, national and international regulators. So think about even the issues we might ex experience here on a regional level. Um, you know, you might have the ECCB's uh, Dcash, and how would that interact with any digital payment systems in Trinidad, for example? Uh, data privacy, compliance. Cash is still king in our, in our region, and financial conservation, where you know, people really pay on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, think about how much people we still have working uh, on fortnightly shifts, or day shifts even. So people are very uh, financially conservative. So what is the future of uh, FinTech and big data? Well, you can spectate. You can do like my friend here and hide. Alternatively, you can embrace it, yeah? And I think ultimately, we, we, we've seen the good of, of, of FinTech and big data. We've been able to see how uh, you can easily apply for loans, credit cards, mortgages online, how they can be personalized, how they can be customized and, and tailor fit to, to fit your needs. Um, you have all, all these things like uh, these robo-advisors, natural language processing that really gives you that uh, context that you need to make sound and wise financial decisions. They've offered these online platforms that, you know, coupled with uh, other data sources on yourself, give you a better credit score of your, yourself. You may be spending and you don't even know what you're spending on various sources. And so thanks to all of these uh, technology and big data adoptions, uh, we can make uh, better decisions. 
But we are also aware of the bad, um, the lack of compliance, uh, the data quality and data privacy issues, the, the IT costs, um, and so much more. There's a lack of adoption. But uh, these two things I wanted to give you, share with you all, which was technology is a useful servant, but also like a dangerous master. That was from Christian Lange, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And uh, if you look at history, innovation doesn't come from giving people incentives. It comes from creating environments where the ideas can connect. And I think ultimately that's what this workshop is about. It's about creating that forum and in collaboration with what uh, the Commonwealth and TTIFC have been, put, been putting forward. Uh, it's really up to us to be able to connect these ideas, both from the business's standpoint and the consumer standpoint. So the future of FinTech and its use of big data, although still developing in the Caribbean, is here and is growing, and we all have a stake in it and a part to play. Thank you guys very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Rajaram. You can feel free to scan and connect. I will now welcome any questions, and they can be technical or non-technical. <laughs> Enough questions for the team. <laughs> hey, Kevin. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, question for you, particularly in the forum we are in. So, uh, I know big data practices, particularly in Trinidad, is still very um, immature at this point in time because a lot of our data resides in file boxes, right? In paper. So, digitization is still key. Um, from, a, I guess, your experience, from the financial sector point of view, how far are you, how far do you think we are in terms of banks then being able to leverage data and insights in terms of customers um, from that perspective? Are you seeing any trends from the financial sector sort of taking the opportunities big data provides of some of the examples you were mentioning, alternative credit and so forth? Or you know, what, what's your perspective? Yeah. Um I think we're not as far off as a lot of people think we are. Uh, I think, and I mean, a lot of it has come, ha has come because of uh, the onset of the pandemic. Um, people had no choice um, but to move onto online platforms. Um, and as such, uh, most companies right now are like in this multimodal uh, means of operation, where, like you said, a lot of data is still captured um, on, pen and, uh, on paper. Uh, but there's also a lot of people that have invested in systems, in CRM systems, uh, in ACH systems. These things, uh, and every, every bank that pretty much does business with uh, Visa, MasterCard, all of these things are generated uh, system-based, and as a result, they have their own database applications that capture data. Um, in terms of using it, using it to really leverage on customer insight, um, I think that's the part that is very immature still. Um, I think we still have a lot of ways to go. Uh, uh, I, I saw this thing recently where it's like death by dashboards. Everyone has a dashboard for everything. And um, to, to, to us in the region, <laughs> I see someone laughing. <laughs> to us in the region, uh, that's where our focus has been on in terms of data mining, right? Like really just creating a dashboard and monitoring KPIs. But we have not been utilizing it uh, or harnessing it to its fullest potential. And I think um, that's where the adoption truly lies and, and, and harnessing big data, um, that level of personalization. Uh, for example, like John, I, having an advisor or robot advisor tell you that, hey, purchasing something at Massey is probably not a good idea right now. Um, wait until next month and something like that, you know? Uh, that's really where that level of personalization comes in. It's, uh, and, 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 and we have enough data. I think we have enough data, we have enough systems uh, regardless of the level of investment of the system, um, I think we also need to like diversify in terms of uh, the human capital aspect, uh, the technology aspect, and the processes aspect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, building off of that exact question, um, knowing that there are different data streams around, but I understand the application of big data is often, at least uh, globally, for financial services is often through open banking type initiatives or open APIs. Um, are those some of the only solutions to combine all of this data together to use them in new ways, either at the customer-facing uh, uh, customer applications or for 
um, broader applications within the financial sector or also there are other options that make sense in the market as well? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so most of the platforms that have been created recently um, is very regardless of industry. Um, so you can leverage off of uh, tools developed for FMCG, for example, in, in FinTech. Um, so there's that level of uh, commercial platforms available. Um, but then there's also open source, uh, which a lot of people are opting in for right now. Um, Google offers a lot of open source technologies. Microsoft is not as friendly. Um, but definitely, regardless of uh, you know the, the type of platform, I think there's tons of services and tools available uh, right now on the market, whether you want to pay for it or not. I think that's purely based on um, your risk appetite, for example. I think people have their reservations around open source. They think that anything that is free um, on the internet is uh, potentially harmful or threatening to their business. Uh, there's that. Um, cloud services, for example, you have private and public cloud. Public cloud is just going to be cheaper. Private cloud is just going to give you a dedicated amount of services. I think it's really um, based on, like I said, your risk appetite and uh, how much exposure you have and, and are also willing to invest. Do you think we have the population size to really harness the potential of big data to be a profitable venture? And you, you mentioned investment advice. It's a register, it's a regulated activity. Traditionally, you go to a person, you pay them, and they give you advice based on the information you provide. It could be automated through a robot advisor. Big data analytics now, it could comb through your, your social media and churn out advice also. But I was told that people don't pay for investment advice in Trinidad. And it, you know, it, just trying to figure out, do you think it could be profitable? And I've seen, I, there, there's, you, there are use case scenarios you mentioned, um, credit ratings, that's relevant. You can comb through someone's um, social media and churn out a credit rating. If we have an equity crowdfunding platform or a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, it could link with that. And SMEs, one of the problems we have is SMEs cannot get capital to venture into their business models. But is there enough activity to really benefit from it? Yeah, I think um, even if you look at like our population, for example, let's assume that there's just really like 50% um, applicability for like banking. I'm just going off of some numbers that I would have seen people present earlier um, based on like banked and unbanked customers. Uh, let's say that like half of uh, the population, close to 700,000 people can be banked, right? Um, and each one of those persons, uh, let's say that even a smaller cohort of them uh, does like a lot of financial activity, um, paying with debit cards, credit cards, um, withdrawing at ATMs. All of these things contribute to like data points. Uh, so pretty much every time you, and I, let's be realistic, uh, we spend a lot of money like <laughs> uh, typically, right? Um, and it could be in a number of things, investments even. Uh, all of these things generate uh, data points based on yourself. Uh, if, if we were just to do like a rough survey in your room, uh, and I ask everyone if they did more than 20 financial transactions for the past week, you would notice that there's more than, almost more than 5,000 transactions here just in this room over the past seven days, right? Uh, compound that over that 700,000 people that I just told you for the past four or five years. We don't even have to go too far back. I think investments would have been made into systems more significantly at those times. Um, so I do think we have enough data to leverage off of, to harness, to use, um, and also equally so. Uh, I think the problem that we suffer from the most is pretty much uh, on the poor data quality side of things. Um, you know, because traditionally we were reliant on pen and paper to input customer information, I think that's where a lot of our issues stem from uh, currently. Um, you guys had a hard time pronouncing my name. Uh, so imagine if you captured that data point incorrectly and put it down, uh, you would have been reporting against someone else if you were to match it against my ID card, for example. Yeah, so just conceptually things like that is where we struggle. There's huge amounts of opportunity. Um, from every sector to leverage off of big data. It's really just based on like uh, how much work you're willing to invest into it. Thank you, Kevin. I have a question. Um, I think in your presentation, you referred to data as gold. But I want to argue that 
you know, debt is like the lifeblood of most modern economies in this fourth industrial revolution. In fact, in Barbados, we say that reserves are the lifeblood in Trinidad. It's probably, it's probably oil, right? Um, but I want to bring in the public sector. And I want to ask your personal opinion. Uh, because I think there's a, there's a lot of missed opportunities. And for a country like Trinidad, who's thinking about how do we interact, engage with this fintech space, having been a, a last mover, so to speak, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in big data. For example, how do you serve your community better? How do you better target, for example, financial assistance to the poor? You know, how do you better target your tax system so that it becomes more progressive and less regressive and so on? My question is, what, what opportunity is there for a partnership between the private and public sector, the private means the banking institutions, for government to use that data or to partner with the private to use that data to create these types of initiatives I refer to. Now I know, for example, you spoke about GDPR and the ethics around data and so on. So I just wanted to know what you think is the opportunity and is this something that Trinidad can look at as a, 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 a potential pioneering, for example, initiative or policy intervention? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think anonymity uh, to consumers is quite important, but also unimportant at the same time. Think about every time you guys downloaded an application on your smartphone and it asks you to agree to the terms and conditions and you just willingly signed away your personal information. Right. <laughs> So, I mean, we throw our hands in the air and like fuss about like, you know, your consumer rights and um, data privacy and GDPR and CCPAs and so on and so on. But, you know, when it's beneficial to us, we just sign on the dotted lines and move on with life, right? Um, so, not saying that uh, consumers don't care. I think uh, just letting them be aware of what is being used about them. Um, I think that in itself can give a lot of uh, information. Um, but it depends on what it is uh, public would want to use the data for as well. I mean, if it just it's just for like statistical reporting, I mean, everyone wants to quote statistics on a percentage of this amount of the population is doing this amount of business and so on. So, yeah, sure, sure. And that you don't need consumer level data. You just need aggregated data, right? I mean, that should be easily shared. But uh, if it's something a little bit more personal, like for example, um, the names of people uh, that have not paid their taxes uh, for the past year, you know, I, I think people might have a, an issue being uh, having their doors knocked upon, right? So I just think that um, it really is very, very uh, dependent, I guess, on the use case um, of what data is being shared between private and public. I do think that there is some merit it, and I think that there is some level of agreement that should be should be had, uh, pretty much where it's satisfying the needs of public and private sectors, but also satisfying the needs of consumers. Yeah. Actually, is data is the new oil, it's not yeah. gold. <laughs> and I'm not talking because I'm- I wanted to devalue it a little bit. <laughs> This has been, this is, you know, really exciting motherhood for me. Um, what I begin to try to process, and I've had various conversations on this, is how do we get the country, how do we get the people to feel comfortable about data? Because the nature of our society is that they feel we come into a macro them, um, and I was wondering whether within the world of the Commonwealth, whether they have any best practices as to how countries moved the you know, country forward. I mean, this is something that traverses both private and public sector, right? I have been trying to promote data analytics and then the data science and then maybe AI and the TTIFC. Um, and I've had some conversations with say somebody like Eddie DeVees who makes a living with data. And I've put him on to a couple of you know, personal people who I know the businesses. But there's always been still, and these are supposed to be leading business people, um, the reluctance. I just finished a little strat session on a company I've just left. And the two things they say, you know, data and technology. But we have to somehow at a country level make this thing happen. 
how do we get people to understand what is the the carrot or the reward if they give up the data? And and to me that that is really the issue because I think you know and and it's incumbent upon the young people to force it because they understand and they're more open. Open banking is something we've been talking about, but with all due respect. You know, I'm not sure whether the banking sector wants open banking, to be quite honest. So the consumer have to say, partner, make my data available and let all eight banks bid on my business. But then you have to have the private sector willing to give up that data. And then the smallness of the society begins to creep in. So it's, it's not a, it's a, it's a deep, deep issue. It's a cultural, and, and we have to find a solution to paint that vision to get people to understand it. I mean, I think the government understands that with the data, you know, the, 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 the delinquent taxpayers and all that kind of stuff is a byproduct. But it's, it's, that is not the main motive. It is really how do you use data to improve people's lifestyle, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep, deep top, topic. I mean, you know, it's, it's something that I, I welcome the, the Commonwealth putting it on the table. But I was saying to Travis earlier, how do we now make this thing happen? Yeah. You know, I, I tried my best to get my line minister to come, but he says, Young, I'm not interested in top shop. You know, I want action. So I guess what he's telling me is to you make the action and then I will come and talk. So that's my that's our motive. We want to make it happen. Um, and and you know we are welcome, I, I said, happy to see this, you know, this gathering. Um, but how do we do it? I mean, data is there, right? So, you know, I, I thank you for your presentation, you know, but how do we now translate this at a national level? How do we make it, I guess, policy? I yeah. don't know. You know, yes. how do we get the society to be comfortable? You know, I have been trying. I remember, I remember when as an auditor, when, when, when the CSO sent out their forms, and many clients were reluctant. Young, I never fill that out. What for them to know my business? You know, so it's a it's a deep societal thing. I mean, but it talks to the maturity of the society, right? Um, I have been told that our data laws are fairly good, um, and as you quite rightly say, you sign off and you you don't know what you sign on, but because you like the app, so it's a it, this has been a good session. I mean, I don't know, Travis, whether within the toolkit. I mean, I have not had a chance to look at it, whether there are, there are best practices or case, use cases within the 49, is it 49 countries in the Commonwealth? 54, 54 sorry, yes, 2754. Um, of, of being a, you know, as we say Estonia is great in, 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 in digital, is there a country that we know of that has used data? And the truth is the smaller the country should be easier, but of course then the suspicion. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking enough now, but I, I think that's that's what I. Maybe this can be worked. Sure, Kevin comes in because you mentioned Cornwall. I, I mean, your your comments resonate so strongly uh, because even in after we produce this toolkit and we produce our report, you know what we recognized in speaking to countries is what you said, and I think as well as the main issue is literacy. As long as your population is. Um, educated about the advantages and uses of financial technology. I give a simple example. Um, um, my wife's sister in Canada, who's barely 40 odd years old, still goes in a line in a bank, right? Or used to still go in a line in a bank. Um, and then in speaking to my wife about online services and so on over time, she now engages with online banking. That's what financial literacy does. You, you, once you, once people see that other people are using this technology, it is safe, it is trusted, and it does what they intend to do, and there are benefits beyond the traditional services, they begin, begin to engage with it. That is the first step in them turning over their data. The trust element, the use element. So I would say the answer to your question in terms of the action point is, even before all this technology, and I mean, sorry, Kevin, but you're, you know, it sounds nice and lofty, but the simple point is you need to edify your population. That creates, I think the King spoke about demand. 
that, that creates the demand for financial technology. And then the government and the private sector brings in the supply. That, that, that's how we respond. And there are many examples in our report about how countries have been able to do that. FinTech or data? All the same. Okay. All the same. Because I think in understanding the benefits, you're then, as the Kevin said, you're more willing to give your data because you understand how that will benefit you. And how, how come open data, for example, how them having access to your data on aggregate will allow them to create um, preferential um, access and, and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, so y you guys get how thought provoking in the area is, um, but also the complications of uh, practically implementing um, on, on national levels. Uh, traditionally, people have uh, done data operations in silos. Um, so you would have like each uh, sector operating uh, as one, as a silo, and even uh, within the sector, each organization operates in silos. Um, I think there's a high level of dependency through central regula regulators, for example, um, uh, that have like a shared vision. So um, your central banks, uh, your CSOs, and so on. I think greater collaboration needs to come forth from those areas. I mean, yes, uh, private needs to sign off um, for that, uh, I guess, level of uh, equal sharing amongst um, all players involved. Uh, but. Definitely, I think on the consumer level, it's the dangle, uh, the carrot you dangle in front of the, the consumer. That's what makes it so uh, willing to share. Um, and if it's not beneficial to the customer or the consumer, um, they're not going to want to share, right? Uh, and it comes down to that. So if I come now to you um, doing a, a CSO survey and I come at your doorsteps and I ask you for, to fill out this, I have no time, I'm not interested. But if I tell you I'm going to give you a tax break for the next year, I'm almost certain. <laughs> that people will willingly fill out information, right? And it's all about that, uh, that carrot dangling effect, right? Again, it comes down to what our customers, and this is what uh, people have, well, rather, um, private sector has done. Um, they offer incentives, right? Uh, it, whatever it is, you know, a $100 um, gift card, whatever. Um, have, when was the last time you updated it? Actually, yeah. Get Correct. If you, update it, uh, if you update your information, but now they've uh, actually made it quite uh, synonymous with better service. That uh, I could serve you better if you update your personally identifiable information. Is your address still accurate? Is your email address still accurate? And so forth. So um, yeah. I think it's for people to see the value in sharing uh, meaningful and accurate data, um, and also for us to find innovative ways of connecting it. Um, and that could be both private and public. Um, for example, uh, and I'll just throw this one out there because we were thinking about it uh, for a PhD project um, based on power consumption to estimate how much people live in a household. And if you know how much people live in a household, you can know how much credit facilities you can offer within the upcoming lifetime if you just knew who the primary applicant was. Just as a spitball and an idea there, right? So it's for us to come up with the innovative use cases of data, um, leveraging it. Uh, and getting all parties involved to be able to share, but also to see the value to be derived. I'm glad I'm getting so many questions. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Angel Stewart from uh, ENGLP, a local fintech startup. Uh, this issue of digital IDs, as well as data protection and privacy, is something that uh, we've uh, come up against quite regularly recently within our company as we look at ways to implement various uh, fintech solutions in the market. Um, one thing that we found is that apart from this being perhaps an issue of, you might say, lack of uh, technological or financial literacy, there, there is a real risk and there is a real concern on the part of the general consumer, general public. And something happened very recently that uh, illustrated that risk, which was the breach of a major courier company, shipping company, where customer data was stolen, it was breached, and there was very real consequences for the public in that people still haven't gotten back the money from their credit card. So when things like that happen, this is not a pie in the sky, some sort of overblown fear. This is, this is very real. And uh, 
uh, we internally have not found an uh, easy solution for it. Uh, as far as data protection and privacy laws and regulations uh, locally, uh, as far as I know, there's been no consequence. There have been no charges filed. Uh, there are no court cases pending against that uh, company or against anyone. If this was Europe, a breach such as that would have had massive consequences for that business and for the executives, directors, and shareholders of that company. So I'm not so sure locally that from a government level, we have that data protection and privacy framework at a point where we can confidently go to the public and say, look, give us your data. Let us use it. Let us uh, share this among different companies and let us enable your name or your address to go to one company or one government agency and have them share. I'm not so sure that we're there yet. And I must say that the, the lack of that confidence makes it difficult for companies such as ours to introduce uh, innovative solutions into the market because what happens then is that from our standpoint we now need to think about spending money in marketing and gaining public confidence because what it comes down to is that each corporation each entity each startup is a silo and the data that you're able to collect is really based on your relationship with the customer base and with the public. So if they trust your company, then they are likely to share more data with you or to allow you to use the data in certain ways. And if there's a lack of trust, then you, know, you just can't bring certain solutions to market. So that was just my view on, on the topic. So I, I, I guess I'll also just uh, kind of uh, s stem off of your train of thought there. Um, if you just conceptually think about what like, the blockchain represents, which is to be able to publicly trade, um, where that level of um, privacy is not deemed actually, if anything, you need uh, to be able to verify on the blockchain, uh, on the blockchain to confirm trades, right? Um, if that level of adoption is put forward, then you know the notion of having these data points so secure um, becomes obsolete. That's one. That's just on the extreme end of one thing. Uh, on, the other, on the other side, if you do want to analyze data um, and you want to implement like data security, I know, for example, a lot of the uh, international um, credit card services, part of their policy is that uh, uh, like the IDs need to be masked. Um, you can't have the sharing of like your 16-digit credit card uh, within your system without it being masked. The only way it's supposed to be uh, recorded is in a secure database, and that's the only place uh, of origination that you keep the actual record. Anything being tra transferred within the company, it's supposed to be masked, right? Um, and that is part of their PCI DSS compliance. I'm not sure if that acronym rings true with a lot of you, but that's what's supposed to happen. Um, I think that begs the question for like uh, proper data security and data architecture to be developed. Um, there's no need to share my personal name. I could be an ID, right? So Kevin Rajaram doesn't need to be floating around on the index. It could just be ID 00025. And you know, it protects my security. Uh, but then on the opposite side of that, the more anonymized I am, can you really derive any meaningful insight from me? Uh, so there's always those uh, trade-offs that need to be considered. But I think the question that really has to be considered uh, in terms of sharing of data, is what level of anonymity you want to preserve to secure your customers, but also how much you're willing to trade to be able to get anything meaningful or insightful um, to, to, to raise that level of innovation that you were discussing. Yeah, so I mean, those are things that um, I feel people are putting a lot of work into just in the international space um, and, and, and largely around like data architecture and data storage and data transfer. Um, but yeah, definitely we can talk more about that. <laughs>